a case of, uh, you know, where the police murdered a guy, uh, shot him in the neck just for going to a bank. So we'll be back with that. It's Rob Dew, InfoWars.com. This is the Alex Jones Show. That's right. You were tuned in to some of the, I think, the hardest, the hard, most hardcore radio station or radio show in the country right now. This is the Alex Jones Show. I'm Rob Dew. I'm hosting for the next two hours. And uh, this is my guest, Adam Lowey. Was that, did I pronounce that right? Lowey. Lowey. Sorry. He's going to be joining us. Uh, I'm going to, and I'm, I'm going to get to his story. And he's, uh, he's an attorney representing the family of Larry Jackson. And this was a uh, story that, Oh, about two years ago, hit Austin. Uh, Mr. Jackson went into a bank trying to uh, trying to cash a check or do something, do some business at the bank. The doors were locked. He was confronted by a police officer. He ran off. There was a scuffle, and I'll I'll let uh, I'll let uh, Adam tell you more about it. Coming up in the fourth hour, I'm going to show some of the shocking video that I posted yesterday on Infowars.com of the young girls in Mexico convulsing on the floor. Um, after receiving HPV shots. And there's at least 10 to 15 girls on the floor um, having these convulsion attacks. And this is just one of the ways people are being attacked is through these soft kill vaccines. Another way is through overzealous warrior cops who come after people and, and um, are, are trying to be judge, jury, and executioner all at once. We saw this earlier in the week when we showed the video of the, um, the man being killed in San Antonio. Put his hands up. And he gets shot. He is standing still with his hands up for at least two seconds. And he was uh, murdering cold blood. But first, I want to go to that video uh, from KXAN. That give, it'll give you a little bit of context to the story. It's a couple years old now. So let's run that video. You can see around 4 o'clock that afternoon, Larry Jackson Jr. peers into a bank. It had been robbed earlier that morning. After he speaks to a bank employee, Detective Kleinert walks out of the bank and starts talking to Jackson. Two minutes later, Jackson decides to take off. You can see Kleinert run after him from three different camera angles. The chase ended near Shoal Creek with Jackson shot dead. Prosecutors have charged Kleinert with manslaughter. His lawyers say his gun went off accidentally. Kleinert is now awaiting a decision from a federal judge about whether the case can be tried in federal court. At the time of the bank robbery, Kleinert was working on a federal task force. There you go. So overzealous cop. Um, I think he commandeered a vehicle too, didn't he? In the chase? It absolutely is the worst police shooting case I've handled. And I would submit one of the worst police shooting cases in this country. And I think that's evidenced by the fact there was an indictment over what happened. Mm -hmm. um, the very quick summary is Larry goes to the bank. He does run. Kleinert chases him. Kleinert, a senior detective with the Austin Police Department, literally commandeered a civilian car. It was an older woman. Something you see in the movies. Out of a 1970s yeah. movie. Yeah. Tells her to start driving. Her testimony is she was terrified. She testified she didn't even realize or think he was a cop. He was going crazy. She was telling him to calm down. Eventually, Kleinert saw Larry, said, stop, stop, gets out of the car, chases him under the bridge. What happens under the bridge is he attacks him, starts beating him, and then, while Larry was on his hands and knees, Kleinert put a gun to the back of Larry's neck and pulled the trigger. And when I say the back of his neck, the autopsy report confirms, and we saw the body, there is literally a muzzle imprint that was on the back of his neck. It was an execution-style killing, and he murdered him. I think that the indictment, while we are grateful there at least was an indictment, the indictment is wrong. It should not have been a manslaughter indictment. It was not an accident. It was not reckless. It was intentional and it was deliberate. And I think that because of those facts, it's without question the worst police shooting in the history of this city and one of the worst in the nation. And so you've had to deal with the city and the police department in this. What are some of the things that are not coming out about this case that you can see publicly in press and on TV, but that they're not really telling you that you know of? Well, the, the biggest thing is the position of Larry's body. What you hear, the narrative from the city and the police department is this was an accidental shooting. They keep repeating that. It clearly was not accidental. And there's a lot of reasons why it was not accidental. Was he handcuffed? He was not handcuffed. And here's an important point, too. The grand jury testimony has leaked or was filed by the district attorney's office. Kleinert himself in the grand jury testimony stated that Larry Jackson was not a threat. So unlike other police shooting cases where the police officer says, this guy was a threat, I was in danger, Kleinert's not saying that here. So he wasn't a threat, he was shot in the back of the neck, and he was on his hands and knees when he was shot. 
And I think that put together, uh, the city and the police department simply have not educated the public about what happened here. And I will tell you, if it wasn't for the work of my law firm and the forensic experts that we've hired, this family would have never known the actual facts here. We have gone done extensive investigation and done a lot of reconstruction about how he would have had to have been shot if he was shot in the way the bullet went through his body. Mm -hmm. And we have no doubt that he was on his hands and knees. God. And, you know, this goes back. There was another case in, uh, I think, Oakland where the, the cops were arresting some people. Uh, I, don't, I don't know all the details of it, but the guy, he says he was pulling out his taser to tase a guy, and he shot him through the back and killed him. Right. He used his gun. It was the Ox, Oscar Grant case, and right. this is actually fairly similar to that in certain respects. Except there's video of that. Right. That there, shooting, was, there, see there was video of that, and that officer was eventually convicted. Uh, this is different. I think this case is much worse than that case. Because I think this was so deliberate. He was tracked down. I think the Oscar Grant case was one in which the officer clearly uh, was unjustified in the use of force. But it was a type of situation that evolved very quickly. Mm -hmm. This was a case in which the situation evolved quickly due to the actions of a police officer that was out of control. And so I think it's absolutely one of the worst cases we have seen here. And I'm very um, cautious about how this thing's going to play out. And I'm very nervous about how... Or whether this officer is going to have to face a jury over this. And so they're, people, they're trying to get this case thrown out. How, right. how is that working? Right so now? the police officer, he had worked for the police department, Austin Police Department, but he also was on a federal task force. And there's a lot of these federal task mm. force around um, related to a variety of things. But because of that, he and his lawyers were able to argue he has what's called supremacy clause immunity. And this is a type of immunity that literally is from the 1800s. There's mm -hmm. literally only about 20 cases about this type of immunity. And in short, what it is, it was created for when we were a frontier nation and the federal government was worried about peace officers, federal agents doing something in the West and being prosecuted in state court. The government at the time said, no, they should be prosecuted in federal court. They should have the protection of a federal court. And so what's happening now is that this officer who killed a resident in Austin, who is a Austin resident, the case should be in Austin, he was able to remove it to federal court. And the problem with that is he is trying to argue he has supremacy clause immunity, which means if it's granted, he cannot be prosecuted for manslaughter. That is their current argument before the court. And sadly, they have some cases to support that. I'm confident that the judge is going to let this go to a jury, but you never know. Um, just the very fact we have to worry about this mm -hmm. is very disturbing. And I think it shows the lengths in which it is so difficult to hold government accountable when they kill someone. Obviously, if I killed a police officer, I would have no immunity claim. I would be prosecuted for first degree murder, as I should be. But in this case, you have an officer who clearly committed a crime, who was indicted for manslaughter, but he's allowed to use all of these defenses, these immunity defenses which I think are very troubling, very troubling. And I think that's something we're going to see more in the future as you see uh, the federal government and state governments, especially in the police forces, coming together. You're going to see a lot more of this, well, hey, I'm on a federal task force. I can do certain things that I couldn't do as a police officer, but now I can do them because I have this federal protection. And they seem to be using this. The federal government does it. If you go out into the to the woods and, and a, forest, a forest service guy comes up, these guys think they have the power of God. Almost. Right. There, it's a very little understood part of the law unless you actually deal with it. And that is immunity. People don't realize the government, by and large, is immune from being held criminally or civilly responsible for anything they do. And it's a long set of laws that's created by the government because the government mm -hmm. creates the laws. Right. It's, it's, it's fairly obvious. Well, and if you do something to a federal agent, it's like worse than if you were to do it just to a, 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 another person. Absolutely. If you go up and hit a regular person in the jaw, it's, it's assault. If you go up and do it to a federal officer, it's assault of a federal officer, and that takes there's more penalties in that. Correct. And I think that there's some arguments as to why the government should be protected legally um, from a situation like you described. But the problem is, on the other side of the coin, when the government kills mm -hmm. and to have the local authorities be so inhibited from getting this guy convicted, have so many hurdles to get over, it's almost like they've created a situation in which they are dissuading district attorneys from bringing these cases against police officers because the district attorney's office is going to think, this is going to be really difficult. We're not going to be able to do this. So they let that pass they get a no bill, they forget about it. And so that's why this case is so important 
no matter how it plays out. I think it is very important that this case goes to a jury trial. I think it will be a travesty of justice if this officer is allowed to get off, literally get off on an immunity defense. And I think it needs to go to a jury trial. We're going to see. I think I think we'll find out. Is the officer currently working now? The officer actually retired. And mm. I, I put that in quotes, yeah. retired. He was going to face a disciplinary hearing. And the evidence shows that Chief Acevedo was going to fire him. But this officer, who is a 20-year veteran, elected to retire in order to preserve his pension. Hmm. So the city, or more specifically the taxpayers, yeah. are paying this guy $7,000 per month for the rest of his life because he was able to preserve his pension. And that's really a whole nother topic of conversation that I think is a very sad aspect of this case. But he was uh, he is not working in law enforcement anymore, and he never was officially fired because he retired before that happened. Yeah, and they, that's that seems to happen in all forms of government. They know actions about to come down, so they either resign or retire, so they don't have to face the music, they don't have to answer, they don't have to come before grand juries. I guess in this case, he would if at some point you, this case does go to trial. So, what what is the status of the case at this point? So, the status of the case is it is two years old. Yeah. It's literally over two years now, which is really unbelievable if you think about how long that is. There is a trial set in November. But we are all waiting on the immunity decision, which should be around October. But even if the decision says it has to go to trial, we are anticipating that his lawyers will appeal that decision, which they legally can do to the Fifth Circuit. Mm -hmm. So I don't see this thing ending for another year or two. Oh, wow. Well, we're going to be uh, back here with Adam Lowy. Lowy? Lowy. Lowy. Adam Lowy. Sorry about that. Uh, it's the Alex Jones Show. This is Rob Dew hosting. You can watch us live at Infowars.com forward slash show. We are back live. It's the Alex Jones Show. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Uh, join Adam Lowy. He is with me. He's an attorney representing the family of Larry Jackson, who was killed by an Austin police detective back in 2013 for simply not wanting to sit there and um, be hassled as he was going through his daily business. And, uh, of course, the cops did kind of run a uh, demonization campaign against him after they said he, he had passed indiscretions and they oh yeah that's that that, that's always the mo in every right. police shooting case you're not an angel so the, the, therefore you absolutely. deserve to be shot in the neck the police automatically will pull the criminal record they will automatically contact their mainstream media sources to mm -hmm. have them put it out there and make no mistake about it it's planned it's deliberate they know what they're doing and so in this case they claim that he went to the bank to uh commit an identity theft that he was going to pass a fake check or had a fake id and that they had this whole story about what he was going to do. But here's the interesting thing. There was a guy with him that mm -hmm. they know was with him. They were looking for him. They eventually arrested this guy. That other guy's never been charged. So they're telling the public that this was some sort of bank robbery or an identity theft, a federal crime. But his alleged partner has never been charged. The truth of the matter, it wasn't. And that when you start looking and start digging into the details, mm -hmm. I think that what you pointed out is correct. They will always attack the character of the victim because it helps shape the narrative in how they were going to have this thing play out. Right. And, and it also stops the, the public response. They're like, well, maybe, maybe he was a bad guy. Maybe we should just stand down. There was just a, um, it looks like they had a, a protest uh, at the end of August here. Uh, were you involved in that? And that was a, uh, a, a meeting, a panel that the mayor was on, that I was on, that the police chief was on. Over 700 people showed up. It was extremely well attended. Uh, there were some protesters, but most of all, it was a pretty good dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I think by, you know, I've done this for 10 years, and I've been to a lot of these town hall type meetings. Five years ago, you would have had 50 people there. Now you have 700 people there. I think that it's obvious this is a huge issue for people, not just in the minority communities, which it's been an issue for decades mm -hmm. for those folks, but so-called white America now realizes how bad this issue is. And I think we're living a very interesting and important time in our nation's history because of that. Well, that and people getting on social media and making a stink about stuff like this right. in, in all the different avenues that you have, you know, you have email lists, you have newsletters, you have Facebook, Twitter. I mean, you could just go on and on and you keep flooding it out there and you keep people aware of what's going on and that, that gets them interested okay. instead of like, well, I should just go and watch TV. Well, maybe I should go get involved in something uh, about my community because maybe I don't want to be on the wrong end of a gun at some point because I was just walking up to a bank. And that's the big thing. If you think about five years ago, especially 10 years ago, if you had a police shooting, you would have the shooting, the police narrative, and then the media would control the entire narrative. The media 
relies exclusively for their sources on the police. Mm -hmm. So they're going to repeat what the